<clears throat> Hello, good afternoon. It's good to see everybody. It's packed in here. Um, <laughs> my name is Franklin Sermons. I am the director of the Perez Art Museum Miami. And it is my pleasure to address you today as one of the workers here who is not relaxing. <clears throat> It's a pleasure to welcome you to this program of Nary Ward Sunsplashed, which opened this week and remains on view through February 21. This survey is the largest exhibition to date for Ward and comprises more than 20 years of work, work, by this important artist who came to prominence in the 1990s. In addition to a lot of work by the artist, the curator, Diana Nawi, has masterfully and laboriously curated the exhibition. Nawi is the associate curator at PAM and has organized recent exhibitions on Iman Issa and Adler Guerrier, among others. And prior, prior to coming to PAM, she was an assistant curator on the Guggenheim's Abu Dhabi project. I have to say this exhibition would not have happened without the generous financial support of Citibank, our presenting sponsor. We also have received a significant amount of support from the Andy Warhol Foundation and the Funding Arts Network. Miami's Gander and White, and specifically Hiroki Haraguchi, have also provided invaluable in-kind support. And Nari's galleries, Galleria Continua and Lehman Maupin, have been indispensable partners working to put together the exhibition and the great accompanying catalog. Jen Inacio, curatorial assistant, and Emily Vera, head of collections and exhibitions, and Jay Ore brought the work here from various institutions and private collections and the artist's studio, which some people would call a factory. In addition to many, many more people here at PAM, Steve Rose worked hard as a member of Nari's studio team in New York and here on site in Miami. And for coordinating today's effort, I have to thank Mari Robles, our Deputy Director of Education and Public Programs. Nari's work for this exhibition is just about done. So he is relaxing now. I've set up some slides to give a little background on his entry point into this conversation albeit from my own personal point of view. That is my work. After that, Diana Nawi will deliver a eulogy. <clears throat> so I, Nari got out of City University in New York, Hunter College, in 1989 with a BA. Um, let's leave it there. I, 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 come to this image, I think there are many images, of course, that could describe that time, but I'm thinking about that moment and about a time where I would be meeting him shortly thereafter, and thus this, this image of, uh, from Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing. It's an image that might have served in some ways as an artistic image that ushered in a sort of political change in New York. I would say there was a very big difference between 1989 uh, David Dinkins becomes mayor in 1990, and then 1992, uh, when Nari graduates also from the City University of New York, uh, but this time at the Brooklyn College campus. And, and it, was, it was there, I believe, that he studied with William T. Williams. But more importantly, this image is a document of 125th Street, of course, in Harlem in New York City. I met Nari then when he was a participant shortly after graduating uh, in the artist in residence program at Studio Museum. And one of the things that occurred to me, I mean, I think you get the sense of sort of hustle and bustle that happens on this street during the daytime, was that Nari was very much a part of that conversation. And by that I mean he was working. He was not unlike many of the, the, the probably hundreds of people who were peddling wares uh, along this street. So this is a, this is a picture of Nari from maybe not that time, actually it's a little bit later, but 
it, it, it serves as an image that reminds me of him at that point. I was an intern in the museum. He's in the artist residence program. I'm trying to figure out what exactly it is that artists do. And, and one of the things that occurs, if you look at Nari's vest, it's a, I believe it's a Carhartt vest, right? So it would be the kind of vest that most construction workers would wear, uh, most people who labor with their hands. And I remember probably thinking that uh, artists, what do they do? Uh, is it all up here? And how does it happen? And we have this idea, I think, sometimes of a romanticized notion of the artist alone in the studio with their paint can. Um, but in this case, my every encounter with this person, with this artist, uh, was one where the question of labor seemed to be at the heart of what he was doing. He would take, as you see in the exhibition, um, some of these uh, grocery carts and literally use them walking around this neighborhood, picking things up, putting it in there, taking things out, um, gathering materials. And to me, it was one of the ways in which uh, to, to discover how an artist actually makes work. And I think what you see, even in an image, just this little image, is the fact that he takes the process of making art as a process of work and of labor. He's not alone in this conversation in terms of art history and in terms of the contemporary sort of moment and so much of the, uh, I guess, so much of the results of, of things like conceptualism, of things like postmodernism, where there is that aspect to the work that aims to be about something else or for something else or in endeavored to create something else. And so here on the left, you see Joseph Boys in, uh, in Kassel in 1968, or is it 72, uh, when he's doing his 7,000 Oaks piece, a work that was lined up on 22nd Street in Chelsea in addition to uh, its original reference point uh, here in Germany. And, and you see donning the, the material, uh, not, not a Carhartt, but here, you know, using the actual tool of labor. And then on the right is David Hammonds, um, another artist that Nari has referred to as having some sort of uh, influence, perhaps, on his own work. And here what you see is 1983's uh, uh, Blizzard Snowball Sale. And, and so that's David Hammonds out on the street in lower Manhattan as opposed to upper Manhattan, where I think a lot of Nari's initial um, pieces uh, began. Um, but that conversation is important. And I think there's an essay in the catalog by Erica James that, that makes great ties between uh, the influence of, say, someone like David Hammonds, who's also known for his work with found material uh, from a, an older generation, and then also the abstract painter William T. Williams, who I mentioned. And of course, these things don't only exist in, in one context, but they exist in a very significant uh, context in terms of art history, in terms of object making. And so here on the left, you see Pino Pascali's trap from 1968, which is not so much unlike aesthetically uh, Nari's Exodus from 1993. And Exodus was a piece that, that he worked on at Studio Museum in Harlem. Um, it was a, a work that I think I saw in process and, and like most of, of Nari's early work, it stayed with me uh, for a long time, but for different reasons. In this case, uh, I think the, the reminder of the importance of, of material, the idea of arte povera, povera coming from poor, uh, the idea that you can actually make something out of nothing, that you need not be given these materials that you buy in a store, but that you can find them. Uh, and make incredibly powerful uh, objects out of them. Um, the material that you see a lot of in the gallery and similar to this piece, the fire hose material is something that has been there for a very, very long time in Nari's work. And I think we talk about it a lot more now in the context perhaps of some other artists and its relationships to um, 
different ties that might be linked to a historical past, like the history around actual fire hose in this country. And you see it again here, and this is Amazing Grace from 1993. Um, same time, similar material on the floor, but in this case, bringing to the fore a whole other idea that Nari's work is so, so revelatory for, and I think it is that reference that these objects that are found, these objects that have been taken and given a new life in his hands are not solely objects that are inanimate and do not carry a spirit. So here in Amazing Grace, he actually used hundreds, you'll see hundreds of uh, baby carriages. And you get a little bit of a taste of that in the sculpture at the top of the stairs with the wheels. But it's a piece that he would explore that idea further in other ways where the material is completely embedded with a past history, a past spirit, if you will. A few year, well, more than a few years later, uh, 2008, Prospect One in New Orleans. And again, for me, like the experience of seeing the early work, it was another one of those revelatory moments. In this case, and I think it is um, apropos for a lot of the work is that it is, it is brought about by a conversation with a place. And in this sense, this is a, a work that Nari did, one of the most famous, I think, I iconic images of that biennial exhibition, um, which was in a, uh, a, a church that was no longer in use and in the Lower Ninth Ward. So in this area of New Orleans that had been probably the most hit the worst in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, which was such a central part of that show. So this piece, I think, worked with several others to, to really demonstrate and bring home how we look at a space that has been irrevocably altered or changed to think about the spirit that was in there and how that evolves. And that's kind of what he's done here with this, um, pyramid-like structure filled with uh, materials that have had that sort of use value to someone else. And then um, a piece uh, on the left, the, the sketch for uh, an early version of Liquor Soul from 2008. And of course, we have the great piece uh, upstairs. And then you see two versions of this, this kind of work that he's explored further and further in this series. Uh, but you see a, a couple versions installed there uh, in 2010. And this piece was part of a conversation that Nari and I had uh, that pertained to the exhibition The Yehudu, Art for a Forgotten Faith, that came here to Miami in 2009. And, and one of a, the pieces, similar to the one that's installed now, was installed here. Um, a large part of that project, I think, goes back to thinking about Nari and thinking about those encounters of work and of spirituality many, many years ago. And it was one of the things that probably brought me to the conclusion of making that exhibition. Um, and lastly, I, I think that, uh, you know, so much, you see the work in the galleries, you see the artist moving about with the work in the videos, such a, an important aspect to have the sculpture there in the space and then to see it being used, to see how much dynamism he ascribes to what is a static object. And you see invariably that Nari is usually smiling. He captures smiles. He has this aspect to the work where part of it is about going into the neighborhood, talking to people, and actually capturing their smiles. Um, with that in mind, and with the idea of, of another piece in the show that talks about uh, a different um, canning of human material, um, it just reminds me of Nari's spirit. And so I end with this image, and it, a couple other artists who were in that exhibition a um, couple who are in the, uh, in, in the collection here at PAM, in the center, Sanford Biggers, and to uh, his right, uh, Terry Adkins, whose work was also recently acquired. 
Um, Mike Jew is there, Gary Simmons is there. And to give you a sense of the context of Liquor Soul within that moment, it was next to an igloo, an igloo by the Canadian artist Brian Youngian that was filled with uh, tall boys of Budweiser. And, and, and what it was, was it was Brian's, as a Northwest Coast native artist, he was giving liquor back. Um, so that was situated next to Nari's Liquor Soul, in which he's trying to, I think, take an aspect of something that we might consider uh, to have a negative connotation, to put it a, a very positive spin on it, to talk about how uh, liquor might be used as this sort of sacrament. And, and, and Gary Simmons contributed uh, a bottle tree to the exhibition. So those are some of the works that were seen there with the piece. And of course, the thing that I will take away and feel so lucky to be able to walk through the galleries for the next three and a half months is thinking about Nari and that smile in light of this work. Thank you. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today on the occasion of his mid-career retrospective to pay tribute to and to remember the lost works of Neri Ward. We can take this opportunity to mourn these works, to hold hands and cry, as the artist is so fond of saying, but let us also take this opportunity to remember them in their glory, not only in their sad disappearances, but also in their rich and meaningful existences. In speaking about them here today, I hope to illuminate their critical position with within Ward's of the way in which they embody central tenets within his practice, and the way in which they might better help us to understand the works on view upstairs, still with us and present in this moment. When we celebrate accomplishments, we must also take time to rest and recuperate, as the artist is now doing, and to pay tribute to those works who can't be with us. A retrospective look, a look back, must include the opportunity to acknowledge losses alongside achievements. I will speak on five works that have been lost, their meaning, their making, and their destruction, in the hopes that we can have a fuller understanding of Ward's career and his history. Let us begin with praise. Ward was 28 when he attended the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture in Maine in the summer of 1991. At the time, he'd only recently begun to explore working in three dimensions, and while he was there on residence, he wanted to experiment beyond drawing, which before then had been his primary focus. He spent the majority of his summer engaged in two related projects, both of which were set on the outdoor grounds of this residency, and both of which employed found objects from the area. One of the works involved digging a large hole between two electrical poles in the field. At the bottom of this hole, Ward built a mound that contained barbed wire, cloth, and electrical insulators he had uncovered while digging, not unrelated to the electrical capacitors we see in the mango torus on view upstairs. Ward lined the hole with a woven mesh of leather straps and belts from defunct water mills and tin can lids set at the gridded intersection of these straps. At the same time, we see this process of weaving with found and industrial materials again and again in Ward's practice. In his seminal work, Amazing Grace, which Franklin just mentioned, which employed 365 abandoned baby strollers brought together and woven with fire hoses. And here, in Happy Smilers, which is upstairs, a large installation not seen since 1996, in which fire hoses used to bind together discarded furniture and household appliances. This gesture of making lines from physical objects is a means of drawing in the world, a frenetic line work as sculpture. The other work was a large circle of broken glass strewn with crushed tin cans. This form sat between four cross-like posts covered in white roofing tin from which were suspended by bed springs, a large, rusty, corrugated pipe. 
The pipe's fissures were dressed with cotton, the artist's first use of this material that would occur in numerous works as a symbol of history, economy, and healing. We see it used here in the work All Stars from 1995, recently on view at PAM as part of the Caribbean Crossroads of the World exhibition, in which the artist used cotton to cover a distressed baseball bat. This work was an abstract religious tableau that contained symbolic icons and richly metaphorical materials, all overseen by the pipe, which appeared like a fallen, prostrate figure. Ward titled these two works, which fell somewhere between the categories of sculpture, installation, and land art, Praise One and Praise Two. An early engagement with the real world as a site for making, Ward's approach demonstrated not only an impressive ambition, but also a creative fearlessness and an open-minded approach to space, material, and form in response to the environment in which he found himself. His determination that an installation could be a whole, that land art could bear the decorative addition of found materials, and that a conceptually based sculpture could contain religious symbolism is a testament to the multiplicity of influences and singular approach that he employs to push against the notions of contemporary sculpture. His works rely on chance and faith through materials, sight, and process. And contained within this project are central ideas for the artist that have carried him through 20 years. Responding to a site, allowing labor and process to direct a work, willing imagined meanings onto found objects, imbuing chance encounters with narrative, employing an unwieldy sense of scale that relates to the body and the built environment, and to working and reworking and overworking. And what becomes of the two praise pieces? They go back to the earth from whence they came. The materials from each work were placed in the bottom of the hole and covered over with dirt, buried within themselves. Now smoothed over after years of seasons, no trace remains of these early works. And now, a long gone work that implied as its subject from the onset, death, Peacekeeper. Peacekeeper was part of an installation created for the 1995 Whitney Biennial. Ward was given a budget and space in the Whitney's Uptown Breuer building, and in consultation with the curator, Klaus Kurtes, he agreed to present two new works, one freestanding and one wall-based. The sculpture took as its starting point a hearse. It was an aggressive object, one that conjured death immediately. Seeking to accentuate and complicate the heavy presence of this vehicle, Ward covered it in thick black grease and feathers. It appeared as if it had been frosted with petroleum or tarred. The visual result of this gesture was familiar, if haunting, an everyday object transformed into a deep black artifact, frozen in its own coating. The olfactory result was such that it permeated the entire gallery, overtaking the space with the industrial scent of gas and oil. The unintended financial result was a minor legal situation that arose over a dry cleaning bill when a Whitney's patron's fur coat made contact with the permanently wet surface of the car unintentionally. We see this use of vehicles for movement and mechanical industrial products, and oil in particular, recur in various works within Ward's practice, most notably in Crusader, on view here, which is decorated with gas cans and appears to have a light coating of black grease. Peace Creeper, having been featured in the Whitney Biennial, was seen by many people and many of Ward's peers. And in his text published in a catalog for Pam's exhibition, Ralph Lemon, now a longtime collaborator of Ward's, recalls seeing it for the first time. And I quote, I was fascinated by the many marks I saw in Ward's early work, the ritual, post-ritual, new ritual pursuit. More is more seemed a good labor, a poetic rigor. That's what I thought when I first saw the hearse covered in tar grease, peacekeeper a feathered and greased black hearse displayed in a galvanized metal cage with car mufflers strewn above it like heavy cumulus clouds appearing before a storm. Peacekeeper was the best dirty object in the biennial, in my opinion. Dirty, culturally infected, but generous, capacious even, loud, 
a caged tar baby intersidereal Cadillac spaceship, a black hole pimp ride, celestial, fallen, grounded, all of it corrosive, dark, and seductive, blocking light, all of the light stuffed inside the thing, the heavy breathing thing, settled, the perfect vehicle for Walter Benjamin's Angelus Novus, end quote. I should go on to note that in the text, Lemon says that Neri Ward wasn't quite so intimidating in real life, that he was laid back even, and that his work belied his kind demeanor. The title of this work, Peacekeeper, was a reference to the forces active at the time, those trying and largely failing to keep the peace in places such as Rwanda and Bosnia, sites affected by brutal, unthinkable violence. The heavy presence of the hearse spoke to the horror of these moments, and the cage that surrounded it suggested the ways in which we might deal with such trauma, sealing it off from ourselves, compartmentalizing it so that we might escape it. Facing Peacekeeper in this installation was the work Iron Heavens, now on view here. This work takes the same dirty, marked, worked, and worn patina, the same rich blackness of surface achieved through process, and creates something that is once grounded and ascended. Burn baseball bats that suggest menace and use kitchen pans that echo the night sky. We can also see the cotton ward first used in praise too redeployed. Here, it becomes more overtly a representation of healing when applied to the burnt and charred bats. This work lives on in the hands of a private collector, well-packed and well-stored, and now with us, well-installed. Peacekeeper, on the other hand, met a different fate. Following the biennial, the work was sent to Ward's brother's mechanic shop, where it was stored out back. But after his brother sold the shop, there wasn't space, and the coating on the hearse was continuing to off-gas. Ward had no choice but to destroy the piece. It was crushed and sent to the junkyard like so many old cars. How to maintain, how to build and maintain the virgin fertility of our souls. A long title for a big piece. This work was commissioned for the reopening of PS1 Contemporary Art Center, now MoMA PS1, in 1997 in its renovated home in Long Island City. Ward was one of many artists commissioned to create new works expressly for the building, and he was given the attic space to do so. How to build and maintain the virgin fertility of our souls referenced both the building's current function as a museum and its historical one as a public school. Using the paper detritus generated by PS1 staff Ward created an immersive installation that was meant to be a sanctuary space. He laid out the papers he had collected from the staff, mostly their correspondence, back when paper was more common, and he laid it out on thin saran wrap sheets as one might drop seeds into the earth. This act of sowing the papers in part inspired the work's title, a play on the name of a 1936 bulletin on farming written by George Washington Carver. In his case, it was regarding the virgin fertility of the soil. Once the sheets were laid out, Ward then twisted these amalgamations into long ropes that bulged and bubbled like intestines. These ropes were then stung throughout, strung throughout the space, woven together to draw in 3D. This weaving in space again reflects Ward's grounding in drawing. And here, the possibility of using a physical line to create architecture was first tested in a comparatively smaller work from the year before, Vertical Hold, which we now see upstairs in a slightly different form, alongside Hunger Cradle, a web of string and tubing, both of which were shown in a three-person exhibition the artist organized with Janine Antoni and Marcel Odenbach at a firehouse in Harlem. Just as Hunger Cradle contains suspended objects that Ward had found on site, ranging from piano parts to gardening tools, how to build and maintain the virgin fertility of our souls also contain discarded objects from a different moment. On a refrigerator in the space and under vitrines, Ward placed papers, teaching tools he had found under the floorboards in the small attic room in which he had been working. They were things such as notes for learning English, and instructions for catechism class. Thinking of ways to sanctify the space, to turn the everyday into a place for contemplation and pause, 
Word was also burning incense in the fridge, which allowed scented smoke to fill the room. These gestures, the dense webbing, and the burning of incense, while creating an atmospheric and charged site, were also not up to fire code. Combined with the attic location, these aspects contributed to the museum's decision to close the work to the public and make it available by appointment only for the majority of the exhibition's run. This small death was crystallized shortly thereafter when the work, too big, too awkward, and too ephemeral to preserve, was dismantled, and with the exception of the found objects from the schoolhouse, discarded. An important and ongoing aspect of Ward's practice has been collaboration. Sometimes this takes the form of, <clears throat> of large-scale projects achieved in conversation with students or communities, and sometimes this is the outgrowth of a critical relationship in the artist's life. One such relationship was with the artist Chen Zhen. The two met in 1994 when Chen born in China and living in France, was working on a project for the new museum in downtown New York. He needed to burn massive amounts of paper for his project. He would come to use large piles of ash in his exhibition. And the curator sent him uptown to Ward, who was, at that time, burning a lot of things as part of his own practice. The two, who shared an affinity in their work, became close friends and were involved in a number of the same exhibitions and projects. In 1998, at the invitation of curator Jerome Sands, they decided to collaborate on a project for the Vasa Museum in Stockholm, a maritime museum. Thinking about cross-cultural dialogues, they created the work Archipelago, Crash Between Islands to Interfection, a massive, snaking, two-part piece that spoke to the way in which cultures can not only consume one another, but also transform one another. Inspired by the site, with its waterside location and boats, the two artists creating floating, tubular, cyclone shapes that intersected each other. Chen's translucent white form was absorbed or being penetrated by wards, which created a symbiotic relationship of transmutation. While Ward's sculpture was engaged with ideas around states of unconscious, composed of bed parts among other materials, Chen, who was ill at the time, referenced sickness and healing in his work, which was made from IV bags filled with Chinese herbal medicines. Both artists took on the body and mind and then wove their ideas together through a formal engagement that reflected their own cultural exchange. Ward has returned to the idea of dialogue in his work regularly, thinking about the ways in which our own national and cultural identities and traditions interface with those of others and how this process of exchange might transform both parties. Ward has also returned to the physical form of this project, most notably for a 2012 project at Mass Mocha, in which he created the work New Colossus. Made from wooden boards and other found wooden pieces, this work was a giant spiraling funnel, an orifice poised to consume. An archipelago for these two ambitious sculptors to come together meant a work of immense scale impressive to experience then and to see now. But this scale also meant that the work was too large to salvage. It would have to be dismantled to deinstall, and the parts were too unwieldy to ship or to store. Ward and Chen thought they would one day remake the piece should the opportunity to rise. But Chen passed away in 2000, and the work will never be recreated. It remains a critical collaboration for Ward and it lives on in memory as a testament to their friendship. The last work we'll remember today is a well-known, even as Franklin mentioned, definitive work, Diamond Gym Action Network, created in 2008 for the first prospect exhibition in New Orleans, organized by Dan Cameron. Diamond Gym began with the church. The work Amazing Grace, which we mentioned earlier, was first shown in a firehouse in Harlem, but it was initially conceived of to be shown in a church. But the artist couldn't find one in time to produce the work. Cameron, aware of this history, invited Ward to participate in Prospect in part by promising him that he could work in the space of a church. 
which sadly, after Hurricane Katrina, were readily available, congregations decimated by the storm and parishioners scattered. Prospect was intended to do many things, but one of its key mandates was to bring art and visitors to New Orleans in the face of the trauma its residents had experienced, and to put art to service to think and to speak about this recent moment. Ward was one of 80 artists invited to participate, many coming to New Orleans to do site visits, to get to know different communities in the city, and to create new projects for this exhibition. Something that runs throughout Ward's practice is the denial of representation. Ward does not depict or illustrate. He does not represent. Instead, he uses objects, things bound up in identity, history, landscape, memory, and economy to engage, and especially to speak of complex and difficult subjects. Ward has remarked that he concerns himself with the way in which we talk about, and I quote, pain and suffering and transformation without going to specific histories of that representation, end quote. This is how he arrived at his primary working methodology of finding things on the street that are discarded, are in a state of distress, and trying to transform them into something else. Diamond Jim emerges from such methodologies and interests. Having arrived in New Orleans to conceptualize his work, Ward began to think about the potential for growth and what could happen through activism. Thinking about what might not be a reflection of tragedy, but the possibility for something else, something transformative and healing to come out of it. Ward connected this to a place where he lived in Harlem, to Al Sharpton's National Action Network, which the artist has referred to as a communal house of justice. This organization is a dynamic model for community activism, attending to issues big and small, affecting those in the neighborhood and beyond. Its headquarters are located in a storefront that used to house a gym, the Diamond Gym, the name of which is still visible on its window panes alongside mirrored walls, both traces of its former use. For Ward, there was a distinct relationship between this place of physical transformation that became a space of cultural change and possibility. He felt that what was needed by the congregation he was working with in New Orleans was a diamond gym of their own, a place for transformation and activism. And so Ward created a massive metal diamond at the center of the space made from exercise equipment and lights. Playing in the space was an audio track that sampled speeches by Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr., all mixed in with Tina Turner reciting Buddhist chants. Surrounding the sculpture were large mirrors that reflected the piece. And on the other side, the mirror served as a community bulletin board on which members of the neighborhood could post their photos, notes, and announcements. An artwork that could serve a real communicative function for the people who encountered it. In her essay for Ward's catalog, curator Naomi Beckwith writes of this project that, quote, Diamond Jim appears in defiance of its material origins. Shards of lumber, shattered exercise equipments, things that were once whole and smashed apart. Ward meticulously reassembles these once displaced things into an incandescent symbol of value. The diamond remains uncannily stable and present, end quote. In this project, we see Ward's site responsiveness at its best, reacting to a context and its particularities and needs, and allowing transposition, symbolism, and material to guide his ideas and making. Ward gave this piece to the church it was created for in the hopes that they could keep it. Unfortunately, the reverend with whom Ward had made this agreement passed away, and as the church was being renovated, members of the congregation thought it had simply been abandoned. So they scrapped it, clearing out the space and dismantling and discarding the sculpture. Each of these works, as they might be read through the lenses of site specificity and responsiveness, social commentary, community engagement, and collaboration, speak to the many facets of Ward's career. Taken in conjunction with one another and with the works we have on view today in our galleries, I hope that we are able to gain a fuller and richer understanding of Ward's multivalent and complex approach to art making. And while we might see, hear, feel, and experience Ward's works in the galleries of the museum during this exhibition, 
I hope that we are also able to understand, through this commemoration, the ways in which works that we will never again encounter still resonate in the artist practice today. Thank you. Um, so, Neri is going to prepare, and then he'll join me on stage for a Q&A um, with you guys. So we'll just give him a moment to gather himself. How do you feel? Oh, yeah, thank you, great. It's very relaxing. Um, and I'm excited to hear, uh, take any questions from uh, the audience. Could, uh, could you make some connection um, between the works that we've seen, which all share in common uh, that, that they've uh, left this, wor left our world, if not left the earth, uh, to your own Origins and uh, the the community of uh, of the Caribbean, um, particularly in light of the fact that you're showing here in Miami. Um, I mean, that's a, I think that's a big question in a lot of ways because I think Sorry. part of what I've learned from the show, maybe it's directed at what you're asking, is this sense of not being in one place. You know, this this idea of um, your, in your body or in one place, but in your connectedness, it's dispersed. And I feel like there's an element of that in perhaps even my desire to create in, in a lot of the works, the, in, in even being, um, being affected, uh, referencing street memorials, this notion of trying to take multiplicity of time and the urgency of time and have the viewer and the participant react in that moment, even though the time is very uh, spread out. So maybe that also gets back to this idea of being in different places and trying to find and carve out a moment of time for recognition of self. Um, so I don't know if does that in any way address your question. Right. I think the show, yeah, I feel like there is that happening in the show. I mean, the, the great thing about the Perez is that it is this, um, it is this kind of in this gateway space of Miami and um, the Caribbean and Americas. And so there's this, uh, for me, very honored moment of presenting my work in this context uh, because it's so relevant. Uh, so it really makes sense. Thank you for being here. I just want to, if you could, just elaborate a little bit on the pre-talk massage that you were having. I, I, I well, you I know, mean, from it, your work and the history behind your work, I assume there was a meaning behind something so, uh, so common and, and wonderful. It was wonderful. Thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, it got back to my anxiety. I think a lot of my work is all coming out of anxiety, whether it's something, a news story I saw, see on, um, or something that's happening in the neighborhood, and how do you deal with it? And my way is just 
you know, saying, okay, what can I do about this? So I was talking to the curator, Diane Nawi, and I said, you know, I don't, I don't really want to do a regular artist talk. You know, it was part of the contract that she reminded me that I signed, I didn't realize. But anyway, I'm just kidding. So I said, she says, well, you can do what you want to do. And I said, you know, I just want to relax. I really don't want to stress out. And she says, well, find a way to, to find a way to relax. So we sat down after many drinks um, conversation and found a way that I would be really happy that would then facilitate the, the need to have folks hear me talk about my work. So that's basically what we're doing. And one other thing I think that, that was a really interesting thing for me was to think that the exhibition is upstairs and a lot of your work is about that firsthand encounter and experience of artwork. And so to be here and looking at objects that are so close in imagery didn't feel like it would totally do justice. So it also kind of sought to ask what could be the function, what could be the addendum, way in which we could expand the exhibition beyond its physical grounds, beyond its catalog, and, and bring something else in. And, and there's a long, I mean, this was just a small portion of the works that um, have been destroyed in the course of his career. So it's very much at the end of um, thinking about what, what could we add and what could we do. And also Neri's tired, he's worked a lot. <laughs> it's rejuvenating, I'm rejuvenated now. <laughs> The Paris Museum makes dreams come true, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Testament. Although the flowers here imply something beyond that. And, you know, I had just come to the show quickly before the talk, so I only had a quick perusal. I'm familiar with your other work. But I think the biggest impact is just paying attention to the news my whole life but particularly in the last few years, it seems there's been heightened anxiety. And so I was wondering if you were also the black body, you know, because at first, truly, I wondered, was this a living person? Right. Being prepared um, for what? You know, very quickly it seemed like massage, but the flowers tell me something else. So I wondered about that. I think in a way, in some ways, that's always been um, my strategy, right? There's this dark side of things that you can choose to go to, and then there's this more lighter possibility, and then there are all these degrees of um, parked possibilities in between. So I, I kind of feel like when I try to make a work with a heavy symbol, you know, whether it's American flag or a hearse, then it's the challenge is then how to pull it back, you know, and, and sound does that sometimes, um, craft does that sometimes. So the massage pulled the body back into another, um, not necessarily death, but maybe relaxation, leisure, you know, and, and still having it there. And I think that's, that's the benefit. That's, that's also one I think, what I think artists are good at is collapsing the different expectations and so that the viewer has to kind of reground themselves and find another way to um, to think about something. I have one. What inspired you to be an artist? Oh, good question. Um, I really thought initially being an artist was just copying what people um, told you to do, you know? Um, using craft and then making something look good. And that's what I, my formative years was pretty much about. Getting, getting the approval from other people that, yeah, that looks just like what I know, that's cool. And then, then it came down to, well, maybe it's about trying to have people uh, reconsider the things that they might know. And so later in life, I thought maybe artists ask, can ask really interesting questions that other people may not be able to ask. Um, and then in asking questions, create conversation about what might be possible. Um, so I like the idea of starting out with the gratification and then maybe um, ending up in a place where it's more about getting people to talk about things. I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, sort of a strange question. Be, just your relationship with particular materials. A lot of the materials you have you use have particular histories connected to them or real um, or symbolic worth. Um, but somehow I just wondered if you had a 
kind of, do you think that materials carry certain energies with them? Because it somehow, something resonates in those terms in the show for me. And I was just wondering how you thought about that. Yeah, yeah I think, you know, the, that's the very kind of strange, um, sort of schizophrenic component maybe um, of my upbringing, right? Because then there's this kind of folk um, notion of things that you collect on a street, they still have the, the person's um, energy on them. And then, then uh, you know, the other side is, you know, the kind of post-minimalist conversation about the object and uh, kind of industrial object and how giving that a different kind of history. Um, and so I feel like I always, I'm always gravitating and negotiating those, um, this kind of charged, uh, idea of the object and then this this object is the sterile starting space and and that's what i mean i feel like in some ways i've learned i've figured out a, a way a structure where it's about bouncing back and forth trying to trying to be a bridge for both of those kind of conversations to happen so that somebody who's engaged with it on a kind of material transformation is there's enough there for them to um be involved in the dialogue and then somebody who's thinking of it as a kind of formal dialogue um, with material can still have um, part of the conversation as well. Um, but yeah, so there's that, that's, and, and then process, right? There's this thing about what happens to these things, how do they, you know, how do they change? Um, and, and that's always, the biggest, the biggest question and maybe the hardest thing for me is to, to figure out how to make room for chance. Um, and that chance thing is, partly why I'm always hiding things. Like a lot of the work is the weaving and knotting and tying and you're kind of isolating things. I'm trying to somehow shatter the moment so that the viewer can hopefully fill in and that chance is coming from them. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, your brother has a question. <laughs> I just feel like you could expand on the question about how your work incorporates uh, elements of the Caribbean and other communities that are here in the Miami Miami resident. Yeah, I you know the the, the Caribbean component. I, it, I the great thing about this show is I've always been I've always played down my Jamaican artistness. <laughs> what are they saying? Because I always felt like you know labels are really the label becomes a real problem because of uh, this sense of not really feeling a level of connectedness to, to any place, right? And even now, now as we get into, um, I think it's even more prevalent now for young, the younger generation where through you know, social media, they could be interacting with you know, any part of the world in a more intense way than, they, than where they probably aren't, you know, where physically their body is. So this, this disconnect and disparity of place is something that I feel like I'm starting to, um, the show highlights and is really crucial for how I now revisit my work and think about it, you know, from land, the start of the show, the big tree without the wheels. This is, always, this is all about this idea of not being rooted, you know, instead of being root, uh, having a, the traditional notion of a tree is the idea that the tree is about move, the, this, this, object is about movement and growing in movement. And for me, that idea of growing in movement is kind of what, I, um, what I'm learning from my own work and still feeling the connection to the Caribbean as an as a, a important strand for that growth, but then also not, not, um, not discounting the moment that you're in as being as, as just as relevant. Mango tourists. It's a, it's a very specific um, question because I was, you know, site um, specificity is an important thing for me, right? Because you go to a place and you kind of have to reorient yourself, you know, wherever that might be. And the more, um, the more you f it's forcing you to reorient yourself, probably the better. The more disoriented you are, probably the better. But in that case, I was doing a project at Mass Mocha in North Adams, Massachusetts. And um, I was wanting to make a correlation between their use of contemporary art to, to revitalize that town, that community, and Jamaica, where their tourism is supposedly used to, um, as an economic engine. 
So I, but then the criticism in that piece, is in, in the kind of personal criticism, is that these snowmen form of energy are quite impotent. You know, they have all this frenzied movement, visceral movement. They even have a mango, sort of metaphor for, for uh, seed and plant and growth. But they, are, they, are not, they don't have any feet, they don't have any legs. They're kind of stuck. And so I really wanted to talk about this energy that's off the grid, energy that doesn't come into the, um, into the, the you know, the, the sort of um, local space. You know, the, the more isolated these guys are, the, the more successful the piece is. It's about this, the sense of um, alienation that they, they produce. But in at the same time, they have their own, their own drive. And it was really about this, this um, problem. You see, Jamaica, getting back to the, the Jamaican, the Caribbean question, they're kind of well known for maybe cutting their own wrist in a way because they came up with this thing called the um, all-inclusive, right? Where you go to these, these properties and you don't come out. You don't go into the neighborhood and uh, the community and, and have economy around that. And so um, it's created a real problem, right? And in terms of the growth of the island. And so you have investors who have these, these um, places that just become sources for income, but it doesn't filter out. And then you have a kind of n sort of um, new plantation system, like, in a sense, because the workers are sort of bushed, you know, come in. Anyway, that, the mango tourists were a kind of reference to this, this kind of impotence. But again, you know, it's not, and then it's also using the elements from the area because all the, they're bejeweled with these, all these electronic components that I was able to salvage from the site, which is really important. So I don't want to get stuck as that, that's the reading of the work as much as I, that was what drove my concept and energy for the production of the piece. And I want the work to be visually generous enough for anybody to come and have their own interpretation and that's just as valid. Um, so I never want that to, that's why I'm always reluctant when, you know, when, when Diana was saying, Let, let's do the, you know, the, the text, I was like, oh my God, this is, this is the killer. This is the killer of the work. But I know that people need it because they need an entrance point. So we, we try to use the language to, to, to be as open as possible. Thank you guys so much for joining us here. I hope you have a chance to see the exhibition. Thank you, thank you very much.